Buyer's remorse is a is a phenomenon that doesn't always happen. It okay. happens under like certain circumstances. Okay. Some people get uh, dopamine hits by by making a purchase, and others get get the hit by by using the product they purchased. Completely yeah. psychological, not rational, but yet yeah. we're not rational people. When the consumer identifies themselves with the product or with the service, that's when you really get that loyalty. To make the person want to be loyal, you want to you want to really get them to want to identify a part of themselves with your brand. Yeah, so I, I don't always see like uh, loyal customers and like brand advocates as like in the same class, the same group. Hi, this is Rahi and I am an e-commerce uh, retention expert. I welcome you all to our first episode of Retention with Rahi. Let me introduce my guest, Dr. Robert Bennett, Bo Bennett. And uh, he's an author of several books and online courses and one of multiple businesses. He earned his bachelor degree in marketing and developed an interest in psychology while studying marketing, specifically consumer behaviors. Later, Dr. Bo Bennett completed his PhDs in social psychology and has written extensively on critical thinking. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bo Bennett, who will share some insights on how psychological theories in marketing and how they affect our, uh, like our e-commerce customers. So uh, welcome, welcome to the podcast. So. Uh, uh, like uh, the first question which I wanted to discuss because of our uh, customer audience uh, is uh, with your experience in social psychology and you have been into marketing a lot. So uh, how e-commerce businesses can leverage psychological uh, behaviors uh, to sell more stuff? So one of the psychological principles that I found most helpful in marketing comes from a book called Nudge. The whole concept is this idea where you can actually funnel people in a certain direction. Yeah. You, you could kind of like uh, encourage a certain kind of behavior and it's really done at, an, at a, sub, a subconscious level on their part. Of course, your tactics and your behaviors are, are, are clearly um, uh, deliberate, but on their end, it's more subconscious. And here's a great example of that. Here in the United States, one of the the challenges is to get people to want to donate their organs or to donate their organs like in case uh, they get into an accident and, and their organs and like they're, they're not going to live but their organs can save other people's lives yeah. so prior to i don't know a certain date what they used to do is they used to have a a little checkbox on your um when, when you go for your driver's license on the the, the paperwork okay and you would you would check off that um, you would check off that box okay. if if um, if you wanted to donate your organs. And what they did is they changed that so now it's automatically checked, and you have to check to opt out of it. Yeah. <laughs> so what they're doing is they're capitalizing on the default Part. behavior, and uh, and that's a huge principle when it comes to setting up like a website and setting up forms and and helping people kind of funneling them in, in the direction you want them to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's always needs to be very subtle because it can go over the top because nudges can uh, look like uh, like you are falling further or there is a, like this, but nudge is very subtle. And there is also the hook framework, which was also around this thing, like uh, this uses nudges a lot that you play with nudges and then you try to this thing, uh, like uh, put, pull, put, push people into certain direction. But I think... Uh, uh, yeah, so default effect is definitely there. So, uh, in terms of uh, this thing, like, uh, so from a, so this one is from marketing perspective, but, uh, when we look at uh, this, uh, because, uh, uh, what's your take on this, uh, like, uh, how far we should go in the nudges, like, uh, we should go and it should be real nudges or like, uh, like a false scarcity versus real scarcity, or like there is a whole debate around deceptive patterns where I don't want to donate or I don't want to help like those kind of negative messaging, which right. typically comes uh, sometimes in these kind of uh, where they tend to guilt uh, like uh, on send you on the guilt trip to like uh, uh, take action. So what's your take around that? Like uh, how far should we go or uh, there's a line? Yeah, it, it depends on your audience and what what they can tolerate. And it also depends on 
how much you're 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 pushing them. Um, uh, for example, like if if you use this technique too many times, people will get annoyed. Uh, or if it, in, at least it, from my perspective, if it's so like blatant, then yeah. it could be it could be annoying and it could be a big turnoff, and you're not going to want to do business with somebody on, on a regular basis. But that's yeah. another question. Like if if you're just like selling like a one and done type of thing, you yeah. could push them a little farther. You can get away with a little bit more. Yeah. But if you're looking to establish a relationship yeah. uh, like a like a recurring membership or uh, something that you want to have a long term relationship with this client and keep selling them more things, then you got to back off a little bit. But to give an example. I uh, I remember um, well even now like all the time going to my local grocery store. Yeah, they uh, they ask you, and it's just so annoying. Like at the the cash register, the the. Um, the, the person who who uh, ch helps check you out will yeah. ask you like blatantly in front of everybody, would you like to donate a dollar to childhood cancer? <laughs> and they don't say like, or are you a hard hearted bastard who doesn't want to do that? They, they don't go that far, but they do have that like strong pressure. And it's kind of like a default to say yes. Or even if they don't say that on the little device where you check out on the uh, the credit card machine where you put in your card, yeah. it will say like, "Would you like to donate a dollar?" Um, so they that's a little bit different where it's that is kind of like a positive where you have to kind of like opt in, but yeah. you can see that it's kind of more like a high pressure type of opt in, and that's what we're talking about when we're talking about um, like annoying people and uh, pressuring them. And, and you have to you have to really think about the situation, like how badly do you need them to say yes versus how often are they actually coming and do you want to maintain them as a customer? So there, there's a lot of those small factors to keep in mind because people people will get annoyed. I mean, we're, yeah. we're human, of course, and and we don't like the hard sell. We don't yeah. like to be made to feel like we're cheap or we're not uh, we're not giving. So you got to be careful with that technique too. Um, and just to add to that, that I feel there is a human angle also because if it's a machine like uh, on face to face, so it's tough to say no. But if it's like a, someone like on the app or on the website, yeah. you can like easily. <laughs> there is a human like uh, that, and in front of line, like you said, like there are uh, other people listening to the conversation, so you don't want to come across as like uh, yeah. Uh, so, right. so that's it. Um, this thing and also uh, in some uh, where I was reading that uh, they started asking for tip while you are ordering your coffee. So like while before like coffee has been served, they ask you to tip the waiter or something like uh, on the like in Starbucks or anything like uh, on the initial order stage. So so that's also going too far. Uh, like. Uh, because if you don't tip, they might screw up your order or anything like that. So. <laughs> right. It, at, at that point, it becomes sort of like a threat. Yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah. You're, you're going to tip me, right? Because yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still making your coffee. So if you don't, who knows what's going to fall in it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so Another thing along those lines that I get annoyed with is, uh, and I don't know if you, you get these, but they're calls from like the, the local police department. Saying, yeah. "Hey, this is like a local police. You know, you're not in any trouble or anything. But yeah. uh, we just want you. We just want to know if you want to donate to our fund. And a lot of times, that's actually done by recording now. It, okay. Not even like the, the police don't even like yeah. actually call you. Like, but that's good. that's another like really high pressure pseudo threat. Yeah. Like, oh, geez, you know, if I don't if I don't <laughs> donate to the police, I'm going to get on their bad side and I don't want to be on the bad side of my local police. Yeah. So you donate. Uh, it, it's a little bit sleazy, but uh, it's done. So power dynamics is so different in that. So, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's uh, there. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, this thing, like, uh, so one is the nudge and like uh, we discussed the scarcity, but there is always uh, this like uh, when we talk about like donation and this thing. So there is always like uh, uh, because I find those kind of marketing very like they have the marketing superpower, but they are misusing sort of like when they uh, trick you in these. Uh, uh, but especially for uh, donation or like a social causes, uh, uh, this thing. So uh, like uh, uh, 
uh, what's your experience has been like in those cases or in uh, such scenarios where like i heard your interview where you mentioned about the dog and donating around the dog thing so so that's still or uh, is there any other psychological emotion in play over there so well when i mean when somebody's asking for like a like a donation like what's going yeah. on there yeah. Yeah. yeah so there's um there's obviously the the psychological concept of you want to you want to be a good person and they if if they do this well like if if you have a good sales pitch you yeah. kind of build the person up like as a good person or or you by like buying the certain product or something yeah. so if you you want to be consistent with how you feel about yourself yeah. and then of course if you don't donate yeah that good people donate and if you don't donate you're not a good person so that's kind of a way that we want to be consistent with how we feel about ourselves. So we donate for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like in addition to the, the pressure, yeah. we, uh, we don't, we don't want to experience that cognitive dissonance about um, we think we're a good person, but yet we don't donate. So therefore we can't be a good person. So in order to resolve that, we just yeah. go ahead and donate. So that's, um, that, that's another technique. If, if you find a company or a website or something trying to build you up in a way, yeah. trying to make you feel like a good person, make you uh, think of yourself in a positive way. Okay. Usually they're not doing that to be nice. <laughs> there is a, uh, a reason behind mm -hmm. that that yeah. usually requires them getting more money or whatever, yeah. or even, even it, it could be benign, like, yes, they're getting more money for a very useful or very good charity, but okay. there's still, there's still an element of, of manipulation slash persuasion in there. Okay. And as a marketer, like we do it for uh, like, uh, because we sell cosmetics and like uh, we help brands with the pharmaceutics or like uh, supplements and all those things. So those are also, um like uh in the that like it's not uh, just pure this thing but uh, i feel in these kind of uh, industries especially for the health and uh, uh the sensitive these are also like very marketing uh i would say like wild west sort of a thing where uh you can say away with anything you can apply any kind of pressure so so what's your experience with that uh, in terms of uh, uh not donation but like in the terms of sensitive or um uh, like basically what we are discussing is around more like ethics uh, or uh, where the psychology because that's also i feel that uh, these are some superpowers and they should not be deployed as frequently or like when you know or you can reverse engineer the whole thing so what's yeah. your take on this thing like uh, for uh, health supplements or cosmetics or those kind of uh, where they are over the top promises and all those things so yeah, ethics is a huge part of marketing, and there's there's no simple answer because everybody everybody is is kind of like on a different area when it comes to ethics, mm -hmm. and it's not just um it's not just like internally, so yeah. it 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 doesn't mean that some people are good people or some people are horrible people, mm -hmm. some people are good people in desperate situations, and and sometimes horrible people are find themselves in a good situation and don't need to resort to such tactics. So it's mm -hmm. it's not really about the person, but it's about the the, the person plus the environment okay. that that kind of dictates your level of where your line is, where are you, will you not cross the line? Okay. So it, it's, um, you know, if you, I mean, if you could ask me and I, and I could give you my opinion of like, if something is ethical or not, but I, before answering that, like if you were just to ask me, so is it ethical to sort of trick somebody into doing something? I would say, well, wh what's the situation? What's the circumstances around that? Is it, are you tricking them? I don't like to use the word trick because that's kind of loaded. Are you persuading them yeah. for a really good reason? Are you persuading them because you want them to do the right thing? Okay. Um, or maybe they've been negatively persuaded or persuaded in another direction, manipulated in another direction, and yeah. you need that to overcorrect to, to put them in, in the right place. Uh, or is what you're doing strictly for your personal financial gain? Okay. Um, 
and that it doesn't that doesn't mean that it's always bad believe it or not yeah. sometimes you could do things for your personal financial gain that also benefits somebody else and yeah. you you've I'm sure you're you're familiar with sales and how that works and with with sales like a really good salesperson yeah. will sell something because uh, not because they just want to make money, but because they really believe in the product yeah. and they really believe that them selling it to somebody, they will benefit from it as well. Yeah. So th that's a good example where um, where the ethics come into play and it's uh, and, and it could work both ways. Again, there's a lot of factors to consider, but, uh, you know, I'm happy if you want to throw out any situation, I'm happy to kind of uh, freewheel it and, and see what's ethical versus what's not. We could play no. the game. Is this ethical? <laughs> No, so basically from a uh, retention perspective that, uh, uh, so when we look at retention overall, so let's uh, uh, deep into like uh, how we approach, uh, I want your take around it. So I think that would be helpful to like where the psychologist. So one is the, what we say is the first purchase is more like an introduction to the brand sort of like first purchase is always someone is trying out the product. Then there is a buyer's remorse angle. So buyer's remorse, uh, uh, like how you tackle buyer's remorse, which is the immediate after once someone places an order. So in our, this thing, so one is the upsell, cross-sell, where we, the whole ethics and how many products you need to upsell. And if someone is buying, already buying a one, uh, like, uh, uh, like one uh, pack of uh, supplements, should we sell like two or four, uh, like uh, as a bundle of uh, supplements or should we put it up? But just to, uh, coming to the question is like, uh, um, how you handle buyer's remorse or how business should handle buyer's remorse for their uh, customers. So when, when, because that's a part of retention and how people feel about the purchase. Right. Uh, buyer's remorse is a, is a phenomenon that doesn't always happen. It okay. happens under like certain circumstances and it's not something that a company could always control. Okay. Because a lot of times it has to do very specifically with the buyer, with their mindset and with their personal situation. So okay. some people just they spend money they don't have. Uh, they they get well, well, let's start with the factor number one. One of the, the top reasons for buyer's remorse is a really, really strong, persuasive sales pitch. Okay. Now, you think like, well, that's good, isn't it? Well, yes, but when it comes to buyer's remorse, it's not good because that's probably the biggest factor. When people are really emotionally persuaded to make a purchase, they're not thinking. Again, they're acting more on emotion. And then once the emotion starts to subside, so, the cognitive faculties kick in and then they start to realize, oh, crap, you know, why did I buy this? I don't need it. I don't, I don't even want it uh, and I can't afford it. So the one of the best things that you could do is is not focus, not, not do a high pressure, very emotional sales. And I know, like, uh, again, some people will tell you, like, yeah. hey, you want to sell these things and you get the emotion out there. But yeah. that's the short term. If, if you want to make the sale and get out of there. Uh, yeah. But it, it's you know, that's what you could do. But there's also like a um, like an equation because you could say, OK, if I make the really high pressure, high pitch emotional sale, yeah. I'm going to get X amount of dollars. Okay. And, but then I'm going to have like Y amount of of uh, returns. People have buyer remorse. People who, who say like, I don't want this. Take okay. advantage of the 30 day return policy or whatever. OK, uh, so the, and, and then you could say, well, if I bring it down a little bit, if yeah. I back off all that like emotion and high pressure sales pitch, yeah. uh, jack up the logic a little bit, jack up the, the reasoning, get them to really feel as to why they need the product. Well, then the buyer's remorse is going to go way down because they're not making an emotional decision. They're making, well, they're using some emotion, but they're also having, it's a cognitive decision. So that's probably the best factor that you, the best thing to factor when you're talking about a buyer's remorse. Uh, but then there's also the um, the, the follow up. So after they buy something, then you can kind of feed emails to them saying, you know, congratulations on your purchase. You made the right decision. And here's why. 
So maybe then you could really get into with a lot of the logic, like you, you made a good decision, kind of reinforce their decision that they made and explain to them why it's a good decision and kind of be there for them to answer any questions. Because some people, sometimes people just want to talk. They want to say, well, you know, did I make the right decision? And if, if you or somebody on your staff is there for them to kind of answer those questions, to kind of uh, put those uh, put those uh, worries at ease, yeah. then you're going to be in a much better position. Okay, because uh, my understanding was that buyer's remorse is like for every purchase and I never had a bifurcation. Like uh, how we recommend for our clients and like uh, for retention is that uh, you do like value based uh, marketing after that, like uh, during the delivery time or those you sent uh, the benefits and the like tips and how to use the product and those kind of things. So just to reiterate the purchase, but I thought to uh, every purchase gets a little bit of buyer's remorse, but uh, I uh, like that's helpful that uh, this is emotional versus logical. So we need to lean more toward like after purchase, like uh, so in the, the purchase, there might be like an emotional angle, but once someone has bought, then we need to move everything to the logic and try to feed them on this side of things. So, okay. And how's the dopamine? Like, uh, because when I read about like bias remorse, so it was always that dopamine hits and like uh, you have that like uh, 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 like high when you buy something and those kind of things. So is it real or is it like uh, not that much uh, important? Uh, it's real. Okay. Some people get uh, dopamine hits by by making a purchase and others get get the hit by by using the product they purchased or or the service. So that's kind of the key there. You need to make sure they have that feeling, that good feeling for using the product. Again, if you're selling like a crappy product that doesn't work or nobody wants, yeah. then you're going to be in a very difficult position and you're going to find yourself having to use a lot of manipulation, a lot of these per heavy persuasion techniques and you're you're ultimately, you know, not going to make it. You're not going to do very well. You need to have like a product or a service that people really want, that people really are excited about, that people get the, that dopamine hit by using. Therefore, it's continual. It's not just when they buy it, but it's when they use it on a regular basis. Like um, when that you sense like, what? yeah, well, please, please, please. Uh, you were saying, well, well, I was going to say when, when you get something. Uh, you you ha usually have like, um, well, let's just say it's not one or two feelings. Let's say it's on a spectrum. Like on one end, when you when you get a product, receive a product, you're saying, this is amazing. This is fantastic. I'm so glad I bought this. And there's no buyer remorse there. I mean, I, I've, I can think of many things that I bought that that were like that. I'm like, this is great. You know, I, I cannot believe I paid six dollars for this. I would have paid like five times as much. So okay. sometimes there are those really good deals and you feel you feel like you really got your money's worth. And yes. on the other side, when you when you buy something, especially online and you get it, you're like, are you kidding me? I paid how much for this? This is a piece of crap. And then you have complete and total buyer's remorse because okay. the product or the service, at least your your initial uh, view of it, it doesn't meet your expectations of, of what you were sold. So th that's a very important factor in buyer retention is try to match those expectations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll give you a good personal example with uh, with my book marketing company. Yeah. When when I first kind of started off. I used a lot of like hype and, you know, this is like, cause I was, I basically sell services of other people in, in book marketing, what they offer. So okay. I, I used their language and I'm just kind of like a reseller of some of their things. Okay. And I, I realized that this is not working because this is way too hyped up for what they're getting. Okay. So I completely changed my tactics. Like this didn't take me long to realize uh, that I needed to do this first because it's the right thing. You yeah. want to, at least in, in my perspective, again, we're bringing ethics and morality in here. Yeah. I say it's the right thing to do because you don't want to trick people. You don't want to sell them something they're not getting because you're just going to have problems down the line. Yeah. Plus the clients I work with, these are like lifetime clients that write multiple books and they keep on uh, um, yeah. advertising and, and promoting the same book. So you want to keep them. So I set my expectations really clear. In fact, I've got a really funny video on my homepage at bookmarketing.pro 
down in the right hand corner, if you watch it, it's like a 60 second promo that that's like really tells people the way it is in a funny way. Like, look, you're probably not going to be a bestseller. Your book's probably not going to make it. But in order to like, you really want to give your book the best chance possible. And this is the way to do it. So by setting the by setting the expectations yeah. Yeah. in line with yeah. what the customer or client is going to get, yeah. then you're really, really helping to address the potential buyer's remorse that yeah. will inevitably follow if you hype up the uh, expectations way too much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, makes sense, makes sense. And I think uh, uh, like just to add to that, that uh, like for retention, like uh, uh, so the product needs to be there because you can, hack the growth like what we say is like you can hack the growth but for retention the products needs to be good and like you said in that example that you can fool someone one time but you can't fool like people um, like again and uh, those times so i think uh, uh, the buyers uh, like the the product needs to be good to like the first uh, metric so whenever we take up for anything for retention then we look at the reviews the product needs to be good and this thing then only the any strategy or any like uh, psychology will work because this is not the first uh, purchase like it's more about like repeat purchase and all those things so so that kind of uh, some so but that's quite helpful i think uh, from a strategy and this perspective uh next uh, is uh, around uh, like once someone gets the product so uh we pitch a lot of things around endowment that have a lenient return policy have a return like a try on experience and those things so what's your take around that like uh how that and how strong is the endowment effect? Like, uh, because there has been some studies and they talk very positively, but, and most of the brands have very lenient return policy. Like it's not uh, uh, because of, I think because of Amazon. So everybody has uh, like leads to line up uh, as per their standard, but what's your take and how much, uh, how big role that plays into the whole picture? It is very powerful, the endowment effect. The endowment effect, for those who don't know, it's when you value something a lot more because it's yours. Uh, whereas if it weren't yours, you would say, ah, I don't know, I'd, I'd pay like five bucks for it. But if you actually say, okay, here, this is yours, how much would you sell it for? Well, I, I wouldn't take anything less than $8 for it. <laughs> so like the same product, but because yeah. you 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 own it, you, um, yeah. you, you take possession of it, then yeah. it means something differently, completely yeah. psychological, not rational, but yet yeah. we're not rational people. I mean, that's yeah. we're, we're, I mean, yeah. in, in, in general, like as a species, we're not completely rational. We're very emotional. And that's yeah. a good example where emotion comes into play more than uh, more than reason. So yeah. and the endowment effect is uh, is is powerful, but not as much with uh, digital products. Because you don't you don't have that same kind of a tactile ownership with a digital product as as you do with with a physical project uh, product, so um, yeah. So just I guess keep that. That's kind of an important distinction. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, uh, once someone starts using the product, uh, uh, so uh, to make someone loyal or like uh, uh, root out for you or like uh, become more like. Uh, because the toughest part which uh, most of the brands struggle is the referral or a continued loyalty like uh, more than five purchases from a single brand and those kind of things so so uh, when we can consider and uh, how someone becomes loyal to a brand or like attached to a brand or become a part of a community so is there any like uh, like the herd like not herd but a tribe mentality over there or what's uh, like from a psychological perspective if you feel certain about Apple or like a force very, if you're loyal with that product. So what's typically tend to be people's psychology when they attach themselves with the products. So, or if like, uh, yeah, mostly products. It's a lot of this has to do with identity. And what I mean by that is when the consumer identifies themselves with the product or with the service, that's when you really get that loyalty. So for example, you may say, well, I'm the kind of person who wears Nike sneakers. Yeah. You know, that, that's me. I'm a Nike type of guy. So okay. once you get that, once you get that identification, that's when you get the loyalty. Because then all of a sudden it's like a um, like an in-group, out-group sort of thing. Like, oh, geez, I'm not a Reebok person. Are you kidding me? Uh, I would never go through the 
even make Reeboks anymore. I don't, I don't know if I'm dating myself here, <laughs> uh, but I know they do Nike. So yeah. if you can, if you can get yourself okay. to, or if you can get uh, your your clients, your consumers to identify themselves or a part of themselves with your product or service, make it personal to them, okay. then you're going to get that kind of loyalty that you're looking for. Because no longer are they they're being loyal to you in a sense, they okay. feel like they're, again, it's this cognitive dissonance. They're the type of people who wear Nike sneakers. And they think that they're a good person. They're a smart person. They make good decisions. Okay. Therefore, if they didn't support and be loyal to Nike, then they wouldn't be making a good decision. Like if, if they supported another sneaker or so, so they, it's like the brand is part of them and they get a, a cognitive boost by supporting that brand. So make the, make the person want to be, to make the person want to be loyal. You want to, you want to really get them to want to identify a part of themselves with okay. your brand okay. or product or service. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And for smaller brands, like how it would work, because uh, like Nike of the world or like Apple's uh, Apple and like these kind of brands, uh, um, there is a lot of marketing, there is a lot of branding, and there is a lot of uh, uh, like celebrity and uh, endorsement and all those things. But for a small D two C brand or like some kind of uh, like uh, yeah, not mom and pop, but like a uh, start uh, direct to consumer or direct to uh, uh, consumer brand, uh, how they can play with that, like, uh, or they can build that identity. One is, uh, uh, like I've seen some brands uh, with the like social angle or CSR angle, like, uh, that we donate this thing, or we are making the world uh, a better place or like this is sustainable products and those kind of things. But, and we also use that sustainable vegan or like, uh, uh, like those kind of animal cruelty free and all those things. But, um, like yeah, what's your take in around that? Like uh, uh, for smaller brands, not for big, uh, but for someone who's just uh, running a two-year-old company. So how will they play with this identity? Yeah, it's a little bit more challenging because if you are a smaller company or with a brand new brand, new product, new service, then it's it's harder to really to get that identity because people don't know what your brand stands for or what it what it really means yeah. um in in those cases you kind of play on the technology or or play on the uh I, i'm saying technology because that's kind of my domain but yeah. you would you would play on something unique well let me give you an example based on uh what what i do and and maybe your listeners can kind of customize that to their needs so for example one of the companies i run now is bookbud.ai and that's where users could go in and create their own ai based books okay. um just with an idea like nonfiction books so okay. like if i if trying to get people to identify with bookbud it, it's like you know what's that you're a new company it doesn't matter but yeah. the the interesting spin here is this technology you know artificial intelligence this is like the the bigger picture yeah. so yeah. if you if you get people who want to like that's really part of their identity like they are always on top of things they're on the the, the end of the curve when it comes to like new technologies out there they're they're smart uh, they're um, they're on top of things they're not behind uh, okay. they they watch they they read about uh, technology. They they're kept up to date on everything. That's okay. that's how you do it. So now you're you're getting them to associate with artificial intelligence, and your your company is kind of a surrogate for artificial intelligence. The um, the one difference there that well the main difference like obviously the whole Nike thing is a better example. It, yeah. It's a better strategy because you're specific. But if there are many companies out there that are doing the same thing, then you're not going to have that kind of loyalty. You're, okay. you're because then they can yeah, still yeah. they could still yeah. be like high tech and AI, but there are so many different companies they could choose from where they could get that association. So um, the the more specific you can get, the better. But if, if you're brand new, you're starting out, you can't get very specific. Go for the broader theme. 
And then maybe as, as we progress, like people, BookBud will be synonymous with creating AI books. And then maybe that brand will be something that people will identify with in the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like what it meant about like for vegan and like uh, uh, those kind of cruelty free and this thing. I think uh, it's more like piggy banking on a existing mm. trend uh, to, uh, I think Nike also does that like, uh, and they also use celebrity to uh, pass that, uh, that you stand with Jordan or like that's kind of personality. So I think uh, it's the same approach. Uh, uh, so there's no piggy banking, like piggy banking is, uh, not uh, right word, but still I get that. Like, uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, apart from identity, like any other things which we can play around uh, uh, for generating loyalty or like uh, uh, like uh, helping people and also about the sh referral side of things because one is uh, being loyal and one is being uh, like uh, refers to someone or uh, refer someone to the brand or like putting your neck out and uh, promoting the product and uh, these kind of things. So, because we mark a dif distinction between like a loyal customer versus uh, like a brand advocate. So, brand advocates is a next level. So, people might be loyal, but they might keep it to themselves or they might not uh, tell to their uh, friends or family or like colleagues. But uh, uh, we feel that once they cross that uh, threshold, then they get into retention, like a referral mode. So, What's your take like uh, uh, to convert loyal into referral or like promoters and those things? Yeah, so I, I don't always see like uh, loyal customers and like brand advocates as like in the same class, the same group. There yeah. is like the Venn diagram. There's some overlap, but there there are some significant differences. Okay. Like usually you'll have... And here's the better way to put it. Pretty much everybody who is a brand advocate is loyal yeah. Um, yeah, to an extent. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll say that. But but loyal people aren't brand advocates. People are yeah. like, yeah, I love this product, but I'm not going to go around talking about it or yeah. sharing it with people. I'm, yeah. I got other things to do. You know, that's not something I, I'm going to do. And that's yeah. fine. You know, loyal, yeah. loyalty is loyalty. And brand advocates, I would say the exception there with the loyalty is if brand advocates are usually doing what they're doing because they're getting something out of it, uh, okay. whether it's um, some kind of social credit, street credit, or financial, okay. they are usually the type of people who will easily switch to some other brand if they could get what they're currently getting. So they don't always have the loyalty, but uh, it's there when they are a brand advocate. So I hope that makes sense um, okay. in, in terms of that. And then uh, the so like the, the brand advocates, that's that's like a whole area of study. Like, how do you actually create somebody who will be a brand advocate, somebody who will actually go out and and talk about your product? And the, the key is you have to get them really excited about it. Okay. Uh, it. It has to you have to like prove to them in a sense that your product is extremely worth it. And you want them to help other people. Sometimes with uh, with products, like some of the times of the things that we do yeah. in, in the book business, yeah. we have difficulty with this because you don't want, if you know what works extremely well, you yeah. don't want other authors to do the same thing because yeah. you're creating competitors. Yeah. And that's a challenge that a lot of people have with with getting somebody to be a brand advocate in certain areas, depending on their product or service. So you, ha you have to keep that in mind. Like, is your product or service one that your client will want to share with, with their competitors? Okay. And if they are indeed competitors, and it's not one of those situations where, yes, I could do extremely well and you could do extremely well, it's not a zero sum game. Yeah. So then you're going to find where brand advocacy works really well. But if you have that kind of competition in your business, that's going to be a problem if you are looking for brand advocates. So before you go way out of the way and try to put in some kind of program to get these kind of brand advocates, think yeah. about what you're offering and think about their motivations and what motivates them. And if your business is the kind that's better to focus on the loyalty rather than the brand advocacy. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, um, okay, because um, for us, uh, like we put it on a linear curve, so it's like loyalty and then loyalty get uh, uh, 
like promoted to brand promoters but uh, i get that like there is a referral angle which there might be people who might be in it for a like a reward or a uh, benefit program so that's also there but that's uh, comes very early in the journey but uh, for the repeat buyers or this thing it's typically uh, okay okay like i have some this thing but uh, not reservations but like uh, in our experience we have seen more loyal customers moving into brand advocate versus uh, this thing but uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, this thing like how uh, uh, what's the trigger for brand advocates like if we go deep little bit on the uh, brand advocate side so uh, is it the beneficial side or identity still plays a big role or like uh, uh, there is any other uh, any other effect or any other uh, behavior uh, under referral uh, programs, so. So I think with the exception of the financial compensation, like what yeah. people are financially getting from being a brand advocate, the uh, the other one I mentioned was, was the social credit. And that's a big one too. And a lot of times that's even more important uh, okay. because if, if they can get that kind of uh, feedback, positive feedback from their, their peers, then that could be incredibly empowering and motivating too, as opposed to uh, like just getting money for something. So if you have if you have a product, for example, that um, that could like really help the person out. Okay. Let's say, for example, like hair growth or something. Yeah. The person was bald. They put this magic stuff on their head. They took these supplements or whatever, and all of a sudden they have this full head of hair. Yeah. Like that's that's not a zero sum game. You know, it's like, oh, my cousin's bald. He would absolutely love me if I could share this product and turn him on to this and get him to have this luscious full head of hair that I have now. Yeah. Uh, so that's a great example of um, not only not being a zero sum game and yeah. being able to have a brand advocate, but also the psychological reasons behind somebody um, wanting to really promote your product. Because maybe somebody like did them a huge favor and introduced them to this product or service. And now you want to be the type of person that does all these other people a huge favor. And we all know that. I mean, we could all think back to a time when when we went to a great restaurant or something, say, oh, my goodness, you got to try this. Or when yeah. we watched a movie that we absolutely loved and say, you got to see this movie. And we share this with our friends. This is yeah. this is what brand advocacy is about. The movie studios aren't paying us, right? The restaurants aren't paying us all this money to do this. We do this on our own. Why? Because we we have friends and we like our friends and family to have the same great feelings and benefits that we had. So we okay. share it. And that's one of the major motivations. So again, it comes down to your product and service. If your product and service is ripping people off or, it, or you're way over promising and under, under delivering, you're not going to get any brand advocates. You're not going to get people because they don't want to do that to their friends. Yeah. Uh, they may yeah. do that to their enemies as a joke, but who knows? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so cool, cool, cool. I, this is helpful. Like uh, this is, because the both the uh, the street cred part and the like uh, uh, the identity part, I think that's uh, not to consider, and that's not. I think the street cred part is a very interesting one because uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, referral which goes around because of just to showcase that you are cool, or there is a, some genuine help uh, uh, we can do to some uh, for someone. So so that's. Uh, let me give you one more example here. This is uh, something I experienced like, like a month ago. Okay. I was watching this like YouTube video of this kid who, who claimed to be like, a, uh, like, a, like an expert, a book marketing expert in this very like tight domain, like the, the small area. So I was yeah. interested in, in what he had to say. So I was watching a couple of his things and saying, all right. And then he, he did this video where, again, he was yeah. acting as like a brand ambassador and okay. saying like this service was the best and it was fantastic and I got these incredible results. Okay. So I said, all right, you know, for, for 40 bucks, <laughs> I'll test this and see if this is a service I want to add to my array of services that we yeah. offer. I tested it and it was a total and complete failure. I'm like, all right, maybe, maybe I did this wrong. Maybe it wasn't a good book. So I did it again and again, three times. And it turns out like this was a horrible service. Okay. So it was clear to me 
that this this kid was getting paid for that. It was like a paid sponsorship that he didn't disclose or something. But the bigger point is that no longer do I watch any of this kid's videos because I know yeah. I, I know what he's about. Yeah. Um, and this is this is from a uh, like a commercial aspect, but you could think of that from a personal level. Like yeah. if you are a brand ambassador and you start talking up something that doesn't work, that's yeah. not good, then yeah. people are going to stop listening to you. People are going to not take you seriously. They're not going to take you as a credible source of information. But more importantly than that, they're not going to like you. And if you're if you're sharing things with friends and family, well, yeah. you you want your friends and family to like you, of course. So uh, so keep that in mind. Definitely, definitely. And I think uh, um, like celebrities uh, get away with that, like uh, they mm -hmm. might promote a wrong product and uh, they get away with that. But uh, yeah, like I think non uh, disclosing the sponsorship or like uh, uh, doing it without uh, uh, like uh, because this is very this has become very tough uh, in today's day and age, like uh, the whole influencer marketing and who's taking and what's, uh, what's people are recommending. And uh, uh, it's not disclosed uh, in most of the cases. So that's mm -hmm. also uh, currently uh, the landscape is going in that direction. But I think celebrities do get away with that. Uh, they might come around and that we didn't did, did. Like what happened with uh, this, uh, like there's a lot of burn, like people burn their money in crypto and that uh, the whole, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. So, so like- uh, all That day we got in big trouble. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah, all of the big influencers uh, like shook their hand, like uh, walk away. Uh, so, so that's there in the terms of like uh, uh, because of your startup and you have been referring about the the book AI startup. So we wanted to discuss like how the AI is uh, playing into this, uh, but uh, let's uh, discuss like how you are building this up uh, in the terms of brand building or in the terms of uh, in today's with AI and how soon the like how competitive the landscape has become and how uh, like it's becoming more and more easier to build up uh, like a, a new products or new brands. So how you are looking and what's your like game plan for the how to establish a strong brand in this competitive landscape? So. Well, with artificial intelligence and the use of AI, yeah. the, 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 the first and the, the biggest suggestion, biggest uh, uh, advice I have to anybody listening is yeah. embrace it. Do not be one of those people who who fear it. Do not be one of those people who yeah. say this is going to take away jobs and it's going to take away my job and yeah. uh, I hate it. Therefore, I'm not going to use it. Yeah. Don't do that because you're you're going to lose if you yeah. if you're going putting yourself up against artificial intelligence. You're not going to win. Uh, yeah. So just realize that right now. Yeah. Uh, artificial intelligence is here to stay. It's an amazing tool for anybody in business, any entrepreneur who like I, I can't even begin to just say like there what specific reasons you could use it for. You could use it for basically anything that you do. I found in in, in marketing, especially, geez, yeah. um, it, it's been a huge help because I, as I mentioned before, I, I have a hard time with marketing speak, okay. uh, even even as a marketer. I just like kind of cringe, like, ooh, <laughs> like, uh, I can't really say that. Um, and because I also, my, my main area, my PhD, my main area is in critical is thinking, it? reason, logic. So yeah. to kind of move away from that a little bit and and use like some of those logical fallacies and cognitive biases and exploit some of that, I feel like it's exploit exploitation. So yeah. I have a really hard time doing that, but AI has no problem doing that. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll take it and I'll ask artificial intelligence, intelligence to write me something yeah. uh, like, uh, please help me write a, a, a strong persuasive sales pitch okay. using like certain techniques or whatever. I, you don't even have to say that for yeah. this product, three paragraphs, whatever. Yeah. And it does an amazing job. Not only does it do an amazing job, but it also does it within what a second, yeah. three seconds, yeah, saving yeah, yeah. me like countless hours of, of work. Mm -hmm. So just to be able to move at this kind of pace, it's yeah. like having an amazing virtual assistant right by your side who works for free, by the way, yeah. uh, and knows like college level education on virtually everything. So it's a really good tool to use 
and yeah. and to to use to your benefit in in every aspect of your marketing yeah, yeah, yeah. um in terms of limitation like where you feel that ai is not there yet or like uh, uh because like uh, from my perspective uh ai is not across like if there are multiple depart like multiple intersections so like from my perspective i sit at marketing product and uh, tech uh, intersections so ai might get confused in those kind of calls but uh, for a linear thinking or like a from a single uh, skill set i think ai uh, is like uh, far better than a 10 years year old like uh, someone who has been doing for 10 years or more like uh, they are uh, because it's a linear model training so so what's your like uh, where you feel that ai is little bit because they will get there like in next two years or one year. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, next next two months, who knows? I mean, that's the thing, it moves at such an incredibly fast pace. Yeah. And yeah. with each new version that comes out, it's just yeah. mind blowing. But yeah. like right now, especially for, for what I do, yeah. I don't I don't offer artificial intelligence. And I say like, stay away from the fictional material. It okay. can make up stories, but okay. artificial intelligence right now has a very short term memory. Okay. And until they really solve that, where where it remembers everything about you, there's going to be a lot of limitations associated with that. Yeah. I, just imagine, like right now, let's say ChatGPT, you could go on there and you could give it some background information about your business, what you're trying to do, and, yeah. and it'll do a fantastic job. It'll work really well. But just yeah. imagine if you can tell it pretty much everything about your business, yeah. you could feed it in thousands of pages of documents, your entire website, all of your marketing material, your scripts that you have, like just everything. So it would know everything about your business and it will remember that. And then you could you could literally like treat artificial intelligence as like the CEO of your company, like somebody who knows more about you, more about the company than you do. And yeah. uh, that is going to be a huge, huge step forward in artificial intelligence once we have that, I know right now they they have some like you could you could hack it, you could do some local stuff, yeah. um, and and so it's not like completely out of the realm right now, but it's not available to the masses. It's not like something that everybody can easily do. But when that time comes, a lot of the limitations that that we face right now, usually having to do with memory, is um, will be will go away. And I have a feeling that that time is coming soon. One of the other uh, limitations with um, with AI. Uh, oh, geez, what was I thinking of? There was um, <clears throat> the limitation that I deal with probably the most has to do with has to do with it just not being to the level where I want to where I want it to be. So, for example, like uh, with, with like my PhD. Yeah. When I use when I like write or answer somebody about critical thinking, cognitive biases, yeah. I, I answer it like at a PhD level, and I expect that kind of level of uh, of answers. But yeah. really, right now, I find that, um, and I think it's it's well known, like artificial intelligence is sort of like at an undergrad co college level, which is really good for a lot of things, yeah. but it's not quite there at that PhD level that it has that level of knowledge within these individual domains. Yeah. But this is this is what, where are we? We're on December 13th yeah. and right now as we're recording this 2023. Yeah. I mean, give, give it a few months yeah. and it, it'll surpass that. And I'm okay with that, you know? I'm not threatened by artificial intelligence knowing more than I do. I don't think my yeah. PhD is a waste. I don't think like my knowledge is a waste. I yeah. still think I'll have a lot to offer. I just have to rethink how I could use that now yeah. instead of doing a lot of this stuff I did myself, how I could use artificial intelligence and use it profitably and effectively. And, and, I'm, and I think that's the way people have to think. Uh, don't, don't be threatened by it. Um, yeah, and yeah. don't try to compete with it because you're not going to win. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so that's uh, like, uh, so one is decision making, one is like at intersections. So one is like uh, uh, psychology with marketing and this like, it can uh, bundle up few skills, but uh, still it can't bundle up uh, like when you're talking about like feeding all the information. So 
it can write code it knows uh, this thing and it knows marketing but if you give it like a project like end to end i think that's what you mentioned from a memory perspective that it can do a single task but it's not a like a complete end to end project where across multiple departments or multiple uh, fields so if it can combine those multiple fields and build that memory i think that will be yeah that's uh, will be a game changer but uh, yeah uh, and and i th i think we wouldn't be complete if we didn't mention the hallucination problem that artificial intelligence has yeah, which yeah. basically it it just makes stuff up sometimes rather than say i don't know <laughs> or tell you like i, I it, it doesn't know something it will yeah. make something up uh, yeah. so you you, you like, especially if it's really important, you need to check, you need to yeah. check the data that it gives you. But I don't find that as like a major problem. It, it's never yeah. been a major problem. I, I feel like it's, you know, 90 something percent accurate. And yeah. that kind of accuracy is far better than the average person. Like when it comes to writing books, like a yeah. nonfiction book on a topic, it will do a far better job than yeah. the, and I worked with thousands of authors over the last decade plus. Okay. And I could tell you this from, personal experience that yeah. artificial intelligence does a far better job on average than the average author when it comes to writing a nonfiction book, because it has that kind of knowledge, uh, collective knowledge of essentially yeah. the, the entire world yeah. at its fingertips. And, and it, and it's, it writes eloquently and yeah. it says things and it's concise and it's like well-written and yeah. it, it's hard to compete with that. It really is. Doesn't mean it's impossible. Like I said, if I were to write a book on social psychology or something, I think right now I could do a better job. But in six months, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. And also, like uh, uh, how we use it, it's like we feed it outlines. Like uh, so, you might use it for research separately. Once you create an outline, you create a blueprint. Like uh, and uh, like the hallucination and like uh, the wrong facts and wrong years and dates and like mention. Like it's also uh, in the in, in early days when it came out and the whole buzz was around ChatGPT. So we used it and we like uh, published some where the whole article was like some paper was mentioned on some year and this uh, Harvard Business Review like 2003 this report. So those kind of things and all mm -hmm. it all turned out to be false. But like it says it with so much confidence. But uh, I think uh, um, yeah. So then it. Uh, went in that direction but uh, apart from that uh, it's good for separate activity it's just not able to do it all together in one go like uh, sure. so we use it to build up outline research is far better and then once we have the outline or if you have internal notes old notes also you feed them and uh, then it like fill up the whole uh, structure around that and whole conversation around that uh, so but i think sometimes we need to provide the juice or like the score crux of the matter and then AI can fill around that. So that's it. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, this thing, like uh, um, regarding the company, so what's the current uh, role like uh, in the, if you can talk a little bit about the company or your experience has been with the book, because I was very curious about this. Uh, like, because on your page, you have like 10 books, uh, more than 10 books, I think you have written and um, all, right. all around this, uh, 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 psychology and uh, like uh, logical fallacies and all those things. So uh, these are uh, like, uh, so one is this and second is like your AI uh, book business. So I think that's the product. Uh, yeah, so I'll give you a quick story there. When, when I sold my first company of significant value back in yeah. 2001, okay. I, uh, after I did that, I, I took, took some time off and by some time, I mean one day. <laughs> and after that one day, I said, all right, I got to start doing something. So okay. I, I put together a book. I wrote a book called Year to Success, a 740 something page book okay. with a whole bunch of different success principles. And this was before the PhD. So okay. admittedly, it was a little bit um, hyperbolic at the time. Okay. Uh, just a note, I did correct it after I got the PhD. I went through, I re, re, uh, revised the book and made it more science based. But anyway, uh, after I did that, I realized that it was incredibly difficult to get the book promoted to, to get it marketed to get it published yeah. because this was back in 2004 when i was done with the book and uh, things were a lot different than on the internet so i basically went through the whole process and i i ended up starting a company um shortly thereafter to help me do book uh publishing to help anybody publish books okay. so um throughout the years i i've written about um well over a dozen different books mostly on the area of 
psychology, critical thinking, logic, reason, science, like that, that's my primary domain. Um, but in, in the process of, of doing this and helping people out with the book marketing and the book promotion, which our company does, I, when I saw AI come to the scene, the first, my, my first experience w- was with it was writing a book description because I used to write book descriptions for customers. It used to take me like uh, several hours to do it. Um, you'd have to read enough of the book to understand it. And it was, you know, I did a pretty good job, I think. But when I had artificial intelligence do it, I fed it in the information table of contents introduction. It wrote a book description far better than I could ever do, again, within seconds. So I knew that this was a change. This was a major change. Um, and art and AI was here to stay. So I started building companies around that, uh, in integrating artificial intelligence with publishing. And, uh, and that's what my first company was bookbud.ai. And that's when anybody could go there just with an idea and come out with like a, a couple hours later with like a fully published book, a uh, nonfiction book um, in both audio, print and ebook version. And that's that's a that site's taking off. It's really doing well because people identify with it. People always want to be authors, but they've yeah. always kind of had this. Uh, you know, I don't know where to start. It's a lot of work. Well, not anymore. So that's something pretty exciting we're doing. It sounds good. Like uh, there is a because everyone like um, be it's uh, like myself. Uh, uh, everyone has that dream of a like a published author and all those things. So I think uh, uh, it's a uh, and now it's not uh, with the self publishing and this uh, and the whole model has turned on its head and i like uh, uh, in the consulting or like uh, in the agency business it's mostly like that book is the best uh, visiting card you can give to your clients like or the prospects oh, yeah. so it's yeah. like uh, um, instead of a promotion you just send your book to the client like a prospect uh, like office and uh, you just uh, like uh, so so that's the best introduction for your business and the whole ideology and all those things so so that's there and uh, uh, in terms of uh, i think uh, uh, mostly uh, lastly in the terms of ai with uh, this thing like uh, online shopping so if you have anything around, not sorry uh, uh, in the terms of uh, like how you feel that ai will impact the consumer behaviors or like the whole shopping experience or we are wired till the core uh, as a like uh, the whole wiring will be different uh, or it will remain the same like the core desires will remain the same ai is just like an enabler and it will not have much impact on the shopping or a psychological perspective or ai will have a deeper impact on the overall psychological behavior and the whole experience as well so. yeah i think it'll have a huge impact on online shopping and in, in at least one example where it will is with real time live help. Like you're starting to see this now and it's it's getting better where, but to just, just take it from um, the human perspective. When you're on a website and you have a human chat there and you could just like click on the button and you yeah. can speak to somebody, you could chat with like a live person about like anything, any question you have that's not in the FAQs, that's not worded a special way, that doesn't make you press one of the choices, which drives you crazy because you keep on pressing it and then eventually you don't get, you get to a dead end and they don't give you an option for a real person. Mm-hmm. So with, with um, and it, th- a lot of times people have questions before they make a purchase yeah. and they're not ready, they're not willing to make the purchase, especially if it's a high-end purchase without getting their questions answered. And unless you're like a site with Amazon that has billions of users with this massive amount of data where every question that could possibly ever be asked has been asked about the product, then you're, you're, you're in a situation where you could really use AI. So just imagine again, an AI being trained on everything about your business, every possible question that could be asked. Okay. It could provide the answer to like in real time and an extremely good answer with links and everything. And that's where I, I see it going. Like it, it's getting there, okay. uh, but it's not quite there yet. But once that does happen, you'll be able to get on a website and, and with any shopping experience and say, oh, uh, does that shirt come in my size? Does it come in my color? How, do, how does it do with um, 
with uh, multiple yeah. washes? You know, is it going to like all these obscure questions, but things that people want to know yeah. and AI will be able to answer all of that and say, okay, I'm sold, you know, I'll make the purchase. Yeah. So I, I see that that is going to be a huge, huge factor. And in terms of uh, like uh, uh, people behaviors or like, uh, so one is the experience side of things. One is like, uh, uh, any major shift in the terms of, uh, uh, like I would like, because, um, these are very long term patterns, like they don't change, but anything you feel that uh, there will be major shift in the, uh, behavior or the desire angle or like the whole, uh, I don't want to use the word psychology, but like uh, mainly from a, uh, like how the customer will perceive the product or how's the, uh, they will. In, like interaction experience is there, but in the terms of core desires or core experience, like uh, uh, psychology. So how there will be impact around that, or um, you feel that it will be wired uh, to the core or like uh, we will always have the default uh, uh, behavior, uh, which is like uh, uh, not animal instinct, but like a uh, uh, primitive behavior sort of. So. Well, there are two ways to answer that question. One is like uh, from a longer term perspective, and like our real behavior might be linked to our evolutionary process. Yeah. So evolution takes thousands of years to change. So AI is not going to change us at that level. Um, but behaviorally, for example, just to give you one example, based on what I just talked about, like having a website with an AI in there that can answer any question about any obscure product that's on the site and any question that someone might have, just imagine that being kind of like the norm and people will expect that. So that's going to be a behavioral change on the consumer yeah. side. They're going to expect that kind of service and that, that kind of detail. So even if you do have like a human person, yeah. unless it's like the CEO or the owner of the company that knows everything, it's going to be less of a quality you're not going to get the same quality answer. And we know that, like dealing with some people yeah, from yeah. that that work in some huge major call center that have like a list of 20 questions and they're just, yeah. you know, that's what they're working off of. Yeah. So uh, people are going to expect that level of service from now on once AI becomes more mainstream on, on those shopping sites. Yes. That's an interesting point that uh, it's not uh, this way around, but uh, like uh, uh, you have to embrace AI because people will not be able to compete. So the quality will not remain the same and AI will start surpassing the quality mm -hmm. checks or like the quality uh, that's, uh, yeah, uh, so that's also there over there. And uh, I think uh, that's it, that's it. Uh, so uh, anything add you want to add just last thing I wanted to around the retention side of things, like anything you uh, in your current organization or in on current startup, uh, you feel that or overall also uh, any three retention related tactics or uh, like uh, strategies you want to share with our clients, uh, like listeners. Yeah, based on what we were talking about, uh, until that AI becomes yeah. kind of like mainstream, until we have access to that, yeah. I've been personally monitoring my sites. I have the live chat there that does not use AI. It's okay. me. So like when you see Dr. Bo Bennett, that's me. Uh, I'm on there and I feel like that's incredibly important when it comes to retention, when it comes to closing sales. And I've been having huge success with it, that kind of interaction with clients and perspect and, and prospects. Okay. So I, that is a wonderful strategy to be there. And I don't only use that for, for like closing techniques or for um, uh, retention. I use it to really kind of be in the middle of what's going on on my websites. Anytime there's a problem, I get to, like anytime there's a question, I get to see what kind of questions the prospects are having. And I know from that to, to modify the site a little bit, to change the documentation, to make a video, like whatever, I could really customize this based on like real time feedback. So I found that hugely helpful. So that like that real time human chat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. And I think this is uh, like a personal touch. Uh, there is no, uh, like not from AI, like uh, there's nothing but personal. And also it's a very good research tool. Like uh, when you interact with the customers or prospects, so you get to know a lot of things, which is 
very tough to this thing so we always recommend to have interaction or like uh, do customer interviews or like prospect and do it uh, like at least uh, but you are doing it like i think more regularly and like uh, more this thing but it's always helps and it's uh, mainly from a product development also from a features from the sales like it's always helps uh, to be close to the customers so close yeah. to the customers so, so. okay 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 so thank you thank you dr van so i right. think uh, this was helpful and uh, uh, thank you for uh, giving us your time it's been great thank you